And so how do I teach them to be Christians without teaching them to be an American? And so that's that's way more obvious in a tribal third world setting. But when you're in a European yeah. big city urban culture where it's like, yeah, we have Western technologies, we have Western conveniences. There's things that I think, well, we need to have this because now we're a church. And it's like, well, okay, but you need to assess all of that and be flexible. Do we need to have this? Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. Uh, one of our favorite things to do on the show is to invite church planters to sit down and talk with us about the work, uh, the victories that they've seen along the way, the hurdles that they've faced, because a lot of the students in our Bible Institute are praying about church planting. They're, they're praying about missions, and, and these are things that are worth grappling with. And, and who better to do that with than with actual people who are doing uh, the work of church planting and missions. And and so one of these people uh, that are at work doing God's mission in the world is Kale Horvath, a uh, missionary to Budapest, Hungary. Uh, he's also a graduate of the Living Faith Bible Institute and, and someone who's near and dear uh, to the churches in the Living Faith Fellowship. Many of us support him in the work. And so I'm really grateful to have him here with us. And, and with that, I want to welcome Kale Horvath to the show, man. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. Hey, hey, good to be here, man. Good to see you. Well, I think there's a lot of our listeners have joined us over the last couple of years who maybe aren't familiar with you. And I, I really want you to share your story, at least maybe a brief or, or uh, you know, a parenthetical version of your story and, and just share with us how you got to where you're at. I mean, what has the Lord done in your life? Uh, what your church experience was like, uh, how you were raised up and trained uh, to do this work. We want to hear all that stuff. If you don't mind sharing that with us first, that'd be great. Yeah, well, let me just say I, I grew up at, at uh, First Baptist Church in New Philly, Ohio. I'm um, 33, and I was there until I left at about 30 years old when they sent me out. And mm -hmm. I was raised up there, got saved when I was 10 years old under uh, the teaching of Pastor Mark Trotter. Grew up in, in that church in youth ministry, discipleship, all of that, and, and trained there. And, and um, really, when I started training out, it, when I became a young adult, it was when our church was going through some transitions and, and Jeff Bartell had recently come. And I, I, I knew I wanted to be a pastor since I was 16, served at my church every way I could, every, you know, worship team that I could be on, uh, cut my teeth doing that kind of stuff. And then served in middle school ministry, then led middle school ministry. And then, um, while I was still finishing, uh, what was probably then LFBI courses at the time, um, I came on staff in 2015 at FBC, became the youth director. And uh, I did that for four years. And uh, during that time, I had visited Hungary for the first time in 2014. So the year before I came on staff, um, I think I, I, I was I was working at the church. I was probably the maintenance guy or an intern at that point. And, um, and God pricked my heart for Hungary, for missions. And we can talk more about that later, about like mm -hmm. why Hungary. But um, well, it's easy. My family's half Hungarian. So when, when I got the, <laughs> right. it's, it's not that long of a story. And so when I had the opportunity <laughs> to visit with uh, Wildwood Baptist Church, to, I left on the opportunity because like, oh man, I, I get to visit where half my family's from and mm -hmm. fell in love with it, kept going back every year, then twice a year, and all this time while working as a pastor at our church and and Jeff Martell being the pastor, the lead pastor back then, and obviously a, a missionary guy, a missions heart, always talking to me about like, what what do you think God's doing? And, and I knew that God brought me on staff to do something specific in our youth department that, that um, it, there was a lot that needed done. And so when I started to feel like those things had been uh, fulfilled, that's when I really started praying about would mm -hmm. God have us to move. And so it was um, the summer of 2019 where I officially came off staff as the youth pastor and started uh, fundraising. And so, you know, if you're doing your math there, summer of 2019, and I think it was spring of 2020, whenever the... Uh, when COVID hit and shut everything down. So, so that was a wild ride. Yeah, and then, yeah. and then we landed somehow, you know, praise the Lord. He, he provides, we landed in December, December of 2020, two weeks before mm. Christmas. Well, I want you to share a lot about what things have looked like since you got on the ground. I mean, mm. obviously the very first thing you needed to do was learn the language. And that's really 
taken up so much time mm. thus far in your tenure there. Maybe share a little bit about that and why that's such an important part uh, of what you're doing. Be- because mm. uh, I think a lot of people kind of balk at that idea. And a lot of people rely heavily on the concept that if they were to do missions, that, uh, well, most people speak English, but that's just, that's not really how it works everywhere. So mm. maybe share with us why it's so important for you to be learning um, Hungarian. Yeah. Well, so Hungarian, and, and when you say it, it took a lot of time, I, I'm still learning Hungarian, by mm-hmm. the way. This is, I've been learning for three years and I'm still learning. And I still have a Zoom call with my teacher once a week uh, to continue practice and learning. Uh, I'm still not fluent. This is considered one of the top five hardest languages in the world. Some people rank it as high as two or three. And mm. so when you're a monolinguist like us Americans, uh, I remember yeah. thinking this back in 2018, 2019, that doesn't really mean anything to me because I don't speak any languages. So like they're all hard. Right. Um, yeah. But then once you get there and you start learning and you get past the, the fun part of learning a language, learning 100, 200 vocabulary words, learning how to say car, dog, red, yellow, blue, learning how to count. Mm-hmm. Once you get past that stuff and it's actually learning how, because you can't communicate with a bunch of nouns. That's not how right. talking no. works. So once you yeah, get past yeah. that, then you start to learn why a language is hard. I would imagine that you have also learned that you've taken like everything for granted. You've taken grammar <laughs> for granted. Yeah, you've yeah, taken yeah. like the, the phraseology for mm-hmm. granted. So you're, you're learning it in a completely new perspective, which probably gives you an appreciation for just how complicated languages in general oh, yeah. can be. Absolutely. It's, uh, you, you learn, you learn English better. And, and mm-hmm. that's, and that's absolutely true because like, I don't know what the accusative case, I didn't know what the accusative case in English was, but it was a very important part of understanding how Hungarian works. Cause in English, most of the time it's just based on word order and with it being our mother tongue, we do it naturally. We don't even think about mm-hmm. it. But in Hungarian, it's a very specific, I don't want to call it a conjugation, but you change the word when it's the object of a sentence. So you have to mm-hmm. know what that means. And so you have to learn it, you figure it out. But uh, yeah, so with this being such a difficult language, um, and even though the old ladies here said that it's in my blood, I don't think that's how it works. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was I was hoping, you know, hoping for that, hoping that God would give me the gift of tongues, whatever it was. And neither of those, <laughs> it's been just a bunch of hard work. And so mm-hmm. now when we landed here because of COVID, I couldn't do a whole lot anyway. It was just in my head. I'm like, if I'm going to be stuck somewhere, why be stuck in Ohio if I can be stuck in the place I want to be? Right. So th- God really taught me how to hurry up and wait. Um, really a, a theme verse for me since COVID has been Psalm 27, 14, you know, mm-hmm. wait, I say on the Lord, be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Mm-hmm. And, and really that w- even when I was praying to God at the beginning, like, should I do this and this? A lot of times the answer that I felt I received back was wait. And now, now yeah. we know, you know, without pre- getting preachy, waiting is active. It's not this, you know, sedimentary right. sit still and mm-hmm. with my you know, sitting on my hands waiting. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's seeking the Lord on it. But but a lot of things was just me continuing this theme of patience and learning to wait on the Lord and and, and seek him and, and not getting trigger happy like a mm-hmm. Western American who needs everything microwaved and and results instantaneous, right? right? And so I since I had nothing else I could do other than figure out how to live here, um, which was is a wild story, you know, because we arrived, had to do a 10-day police enforced um quarantine and, you know, police rang our doorbell every morning. That was wild. All -hmm. of that aside, it's like, okay, what are we going to do? So January rolled after the holidays, we started finding, you know, what are we going to do? So my wife has been with the same teacher that we found through a contact since she started. She's just done two days a week. She does an hour lesson with her teacher. She's raising our boys. So she's going to learn slower Mm -hmm. anyway, and that's fine. But I knew I needed to really dive into this. And so I found a school that did did what they called super intensive courses. And I joined a class of like 10 other people on Zoom because, you know, nothing was meeting in person. I I haven't taken a single class in person since moving here. It's all been online. Now I do it for convenience because it's great to just come back to this room and do it. Yeah. um, So it was like, I think I took like a total of like four months of these where it was four, four days a week three, three, three and a half hours. I can't remember exactly every day, starting from day one. And, and man, I, I had done some work while I was on deputation, learning some nouns, learning how to pronounce the alphabet, learning how to count. I felt when you, when you start learning a language, you feel like super confident. You're like, man, I, I can, I can basically speak this language. Yeah. It's only a matter of time now. 
Oh yeah. yeah. I exhausted my knowledge. And I think after the first day or two, and then it was like all completely new. And I was like, Oh no. And it was highly immersive. I mean, is it three and a half yeah. hours of just pure conversation and you're just wading through it and they're forcing you to no, How does that look? it was, in, this was an established school and they're, they're very good at what they do. And so it was the, the, the first eight weeks was all in English. And then after they got through the beginning classes, um, of the curriculum, then they switched to only Hungarian, which, mm-hmm. you know, if you weren't taking it super intensive, that would take you six, eight months. And I did it in like right. eight weeks. So my head was spinning constantly after every day after class, I just have a thumping migraine and um but basically it was just work through the book learn the rules see here's the here's what makes hungarian for anyone who's interested so hard after you realize why the language is hard um Mm -hmm. one the grammar rules their grammar is incredibly complex it's it's really like a computer code it's hard to learn how to think in this language and how to decipher it when it's being spoken to you reading's easier it's a phonetic language so you learn how to read i can Mm -hmm. fake it pretty good if i'm just reading (laughs) um but my comprehension isn't high obviously but then the other part that nobody really thinks about, and I didn't realize till later, was it's a language that's not closely related to any other language. It's not an Indo-European language. Um, it, it's not on the language tree. It's, a, it's called a Finno-Ugric, well, Finno-Ugric, however you would say that, uh, language. And so it's distantly related to like Finnish and Estonian. And like that's it. Weird. And I know people who speak both those languages and they don't understand a lick of Hungarian. So it's like wow. what you don't realize is that you're learning 90, 95 percent new vocabulary. Whereas if you're learning as an English speaker, a Latin based language or something sure. like that. Y- yeah, you're learning. But you can you can understand so many words because you see them and you're like, oh, I know what that means. How do you say salvation in Spanish? Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's like it's basically a Spanish accent on the word salvation. You're like, I, I, I recognize <laughs> it, you know, it's like salvation or yeah. something. Yeah, right, right. And But you get into in it's Yudvishik. It, in Hungarian, you're like, oh, that's brand new. So, Man. so the, the complex grammar rules, but then a brand new vocabulary, almost zero overlap, other than 21st century technology like internet, email, mm. stuff like that. Yeah, 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 phone. What's the Hungarian Bible like? That's that's really cool. I got to be short on this because it's really neat. They have a TR Bible. It's a faithful translation okay. that predates the KJV. It was translated in 1590. Wow. It, yeah, by a, a reformer. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and it's a faithful translation. It's been around for a while. Went through a lot of updates and revisions. And so, you know, there's some complexity in there. But like overall, for for a language that's so distant from the rest of the world, that only has, you know, 10 to 15, maybe maybe closer to 20 million speakers possibly, they, they have a really good faithful translation. So that's that's been a huge blessing because I, I can read – in English and Hungarian and compare the two. And, and that helps a lot with learning. And you're, you're not seeing any discrepancies doctrinally when you're, as you read it's minor things, minor things. It's, it's actually, I don't even want to open up this can of worms. Cause I, I did a, a <laughs> conversation with, uh, with Erion Vogli about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I talked to him frequently. It's, it's so cool. Now, now that I speak like a second language at an intermediate level, you're just like, dude, this is so wild to understand how languages work and understand how yeah. God speaks. It's there. There are things, and and on our on my podcast, I did a conversation with Ariel. If people are interested in depth, yeah, you of need this. to plug the podcast real quick. Just make sure oh, that people missionary roundtable. It, it's not a weekly thing. When I uh, I did some seasons, um, but now it's just when I have an interesting conversation, I'll post it. So just yeah. missionary roundtable. You can follow it everywhere. Yeah, it's on. You can find it on the Living Faith Fellowship website. Oh, well, there you go. There's a link there. One of my favorite Bible teachers, I mean, yeah. anytime he's speaking, I'm tuning in. I don't care where he's speaking at, it, mm-hmm. as long as it's in English or Hungarian, and it's never in Hungarian. <laughs> um, but it, one thing that we I got to discuss with him that I would have never understood before is how can a translation be faithful, but maybe have some weak translations in it? And it's really, it's hard to understand, but there can be spots where it's like, this isn't wrong, but it could be stronger. Or right. this isn't wrong, but you lose some depth or you lose some cross references or possibly even this isn't exactly the same as the English, but I don't speak this language well enough to know why God chose to preserve it this way in this language. Sure. Sure. Wild, cool stuff to talk about. Yeah. And super powerful and important actually to know if you're doing work like the work that you're doing. I, I mean, I love the the beauty of it is that God remains faithful and true despite the fact that there are limitations yeah. in in language itself, mm-hmm. that he can say something that's true, 
and and be really, really explicit in one language yeah. and then be faithful and true and maybe less explicit in another language, right? Like, it's really interesting how how even, it, just to think about it in terms of Greek and Hebrew and, and English and the mm-hmm. KJV, how supplementary things are. Like, mm-hmm. like, like how the KJV provides insight and specificity in areas where, well, even the, you know, what's been handed down to us in Greek mm-hmm. may, may not provide that specificity. That's yeah. a way of thinking that most Christians don't have in their tool belt. Well, and something I talked about with Arione, and he, I've heard him talk about before too, is sometimes people, they want to they want to focus on what you would lose in translation, but we don't talk mm-hmm. about what you can also gain exactly. in translation. Yeah. And so Hungarian is a very specific language. That's why it makes it so hard. There's things in English where we have one word for it, like the one that pops to mind is saying the directional to, I'm going to work. I'm going to do that. We use two to say a lot of things mm-hmm. and they have like four different variations for the word to just in reference to very, to direction. And so wow. it's, it's a very specific language. That's another reason what makes it difficult for, for English speakers. Um, but, but you'll see that in, in the Bible as well. So a cool example is that something I just saw as I'm studying to preach a sermon that's going to be translated because I don't speak well enough to preach right now, I don't think. Um, and so I, I preach for translation, but I'm studying in both languages. And so something that was really neat that um, when I was studying the Bible, you know, in parallel, Hungarian and English, mm-hmm. I noticed that the word for, for brother, just in general, we have a word, testvér, which literally means body blood. It's, it's two words put together. So it's literally a physical brother or sister. But in the New Testament, when you start seeing Paul saying brother and referring to brothers in Christ, in English, we have the same word. And you know by context that he's referring to spiritual brothers and sisters. Well, in the Hungarian mm-hmm. Bible, they have a different word, completely different word. Uh-huh. I asked Arion if they had that. And he's like, no, we don't have that. That's interesting. It, it says, Otyafiu, which literally means son of the father. And mm. so when he, when he's talking to brothers who are spiritual brothers and sisters, it literally means son of the father, like son of God, the father. And so it like it, and it, and it tracks Wow, and it's consistent. Yeah. And it's like, that opens it up even more. And I can, it, it makes a preaching point in their language that, Hey, look at this. We're supposed to love. So I was speech, I was preaching on brotherly love and I could make a differentiation that was very clear in their language that we are to mm. love the brothers, the brethren of the house of God at a different level than just even regular people that we're also called to love. And now you can wow. make that same point in English, but when it's clear and black and white in the language, it's, sure. it was just really neat. Man, praise the Lord. What, yeah. what a relief to have a, a, a Bible that you can trust. I mean, I don't think, not every missionary um, yeah. can say the same thing. And so praise the Lord that that's not a deficit that you're going into. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, what's soul winning like? Tell, tell us about what reaching the lost has been like since you got there. Mm-hmm. Well, it's very much been trusting the Lord. Um, it's it's not a openly warm culture like maybe you would think of like a Latin America or um, or wh- wherever you think of. It's not just like a, a warm, inviting. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. It's just a you know the reality. It's it, it's not yeah. easy to make close friends. Um, whereas in some cultures you think you're making close friends, but you're making just surface level friends, you know, mm-hmm. re- quickly. And so when you really make a friend here, it's, it's, it's a real friend, but it takes a long time. And so I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, friend, faith, fellowship style, um, evangelism. I think all evangelism strategies and methodologies are important and, and can apply. But then when you get to a culture, you have to figure out what's going to work, not only for this people, but for me, where I'm at right now. So when I got here, mm-hmm. I didn't speak the language at all. So I was like, well, I, I can't, I can't go out on the street if I wanted to. I, I, don't, I don't speak the language. You know, I, right. I don't have a translator. We came here alone. We didn't join anyone. If you're joining a veteran missionary and you have translators and people to, to work under, well then you go out on the street, but we, we, it yeah. would make sense. So it just started with a lot of praying and God showed me, um, I'm, a, I'm also just more comfortable with friend, faith, fellowship. You, you come to a, you know, a Eastern Bloc country that was ruled by, you know, the Soviets just 30 years ago. And so, you know, and before that they were ruled by, you know, you know, the, I mean, you got the Germans, the Soviets, the Turks, you know, all, all these different peoples that have come and ruled. And so that plays into culture. It plays into how people guard themselves, how they think. Mm. And so you're learning all that and also playing with the cards you're dealt. I don't speak the language yet. I also came in the middle of a pandemic. Nobody's talking to anybody they don't know. Nobody's going out on the street. Everybody's wearing a mask and has a plexiglass in front of them. And so even <laughs> if I wanted to talk to them, 
it's incredibly difficult. So you're playing with the cards that you're dealt. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just reading, I'm doing grammar study every day and, and I'm reading the Bible and I'm praying and God shows me Acts 8 and Acts 10. And so Acts 8, obviously you have the Ethiopian eunuch, a man who was seeking truth. And then God sent a man of God to him to expound it. Acts 10, you have Cornelius, a man who was seeking truth and God sent him to the man of God and, and obviously Peter came to him, but, but God's, you know, sent him specifically to the man of God. So you have two people, you have two seeking men, one who God sends the missionary to him and the other one that God sends the man to the missionary. And so mm -hmm. I just started praying that God would, I just started praying for seeking men, that God would send me seeking men, that God would send me to seeking men in my everyday life. And, and it's really cool because I, I, opportunities came in both scenarios yeah. where, you know, I was put into a different class than I expected to be in Hungarian and got managed to meet with a guy IRL, you know, and not just in the Zoom class and, and share the gospel with him before he went back to his home country. And, um, and and some of the friends that we have today are from that praying and God bringing people to us. And and it took them years to get saved, but they were seeking and they didn't even know they were wow. seeking God. That's why I said like seeking truth. Sometimes guys don't even know they're seeking God. They're just seeking. They've responded maybe to the general revelation of God. And they need the specific revelation. And so sure. God's faithful um, to, to bring them to a man of God or bring a man of God to them. So that's really where I started. And then we started building friendships, building cl close relationships, did Bible study. Bible study slowly led to salvations. Bible study slowly led to the church plant over the last year and year, year and a half. Yeah. And you had kind of an interesting situation where up to just recently, you were a you were doing evangelical work, you were pre mm -hmm. preparing, but you were submitted to a local church there um, th where oh. you were attending. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that yeah. was like kind of an important transition because mm -hmm. you had a place to go, you had fellowship, you had other believers, mm -hmm. but then but then n now you've kind of shifted away from that. Yeah, God did provide, that was, that was a really cool thing because we came alone um, with a clear calling and, and some contacts, but then COVID COVID took all our plans and shoved them down the drain. It was really mm -hmm. reevaluating and listening for how God wanted us to operate. And um, so the first six months-ish, we we didn't go to any church at all. We couldn't. None were open. They weren't allowed to meet, um, even if we wanted to go. And so we were watching FBC online and um, praying about, okay, when things start to open up, should we go to a church? Should we not? Because I, you know, I didn't want to make a carnal decision. I wanted God to make the decision. And so in my mm -hmm. carnality, I could say I need a church because I'm lonely. In my carnality, I could also say I don't need a church because I'm super spiritual. But at the same time, there's you need fellowship with Christians. But also there's the reality of guys, you know, Philadelphian church age guys. They didn't go to church until they made the church. It took yeah. decades to, you know, so yeah, I was, I was part of the thing of to, being a missionary. Yeah, so I was surrendered to either option, but then the Lord sent a contact um, through through a, through another man, uh, actually Dave Shelby at a uh, um, in Kansas Iola. at Iola, yeah. and uh, sent me a contact he had met years ago, and I just emailed him, and he, this guy was starting a new church plant uh, maybe in 2019 in Budapest. So started hanging out with him and just going and, uh, got to see what church planting can look like. You know, even if we, we didn't agree on everything, it was great fellowship. He's taught me a lot. I still talk to him regularly and run, bounce things off of him, ask him, Hey man, is this a good translation? I'm setting up my vision statement. There's like nine words I could use here. And, but what's mm -hmm. the, what's the Baptist way of saying this? You know what I'm trying <laughs> to say and you know, mm -hmm. and so he's been a, huge resource for me. And, and we, we oh, went great. there for about a year um, before we started yeah. doing our weekly Bible studies uh, on our own. Man, praise the Lord. So you just uh, recently found a space um, mm -hmm. and you've been remodeling it and preparing it and starting in January, really at the very beginning of the year, am I, am I right? Is January yeah. when you first started meeting, well, you started it, doing Sunday services, correct? Yeah. We, we did one service kind of as a test run in December before Christmas as like a Christmas service just to, you know, it, it, it was an easy way to, to invite people to come to, mm -hmm. you know, invite family members and stuff. And so that was kind of a dry run, but I just say January. And what's that been like? I mean, preparing for that, it seemed like there was a lot of hard work going into that. Oh yeah. It's so much work. So it's, 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 but it's so much fun too, because that's what we've been dreaming about since 2018 you know, um, is, is where we're at today. And so many times in the first three years when we were 
just stuck here, didn't know what we were doing, pounding our head against the wall with the language. And, and you're just like, can we skip to the good part? Can we skip to the part that's fun yeah. in the ministry? And, and, and now we're at, we're at, and again, we're at the beginning of the work. Now the work has just started, but it's the work you dreamed about doing for the last five years. And so to be here is like, it's, it's, it's incredibly busy and exhausting, but it's also really fulfilling too. So yeah, so I'm preaching every Sunday. Um, you started by just kind of starting with Christian basics. Everyone who started that we started our church with now, some people have come along since, which is praise the Lord for that. But everyone mm-hmm. we started with was someone that we led to the Lord through our ministry um, and through our Bible study. And so we didn't start with people who were already Christians. We started with baby Christians that we led to the Lord, which yeah. I, which is the ideal. I think it's what yeah. we, we tell everybody you should want to do, but it's also really hard because none of these guys grew up in church. They don't know what church looks like. And so you're trying to show them and teach them. Um, but, but you also don't have help in the ministry. You know what I mean? So you're like, you got to do it all and show them. And then, you know, you want them to come alongside you in due time. But at the beginning, you're, you're teaching them Christian basics. You're teaching yeah. them why church is good, why it's important to prioritize. You're teaching them everything. Like right in, in a couple of weeks, you know, we're doing uh, Easter sermons this you know, at this time, I don't know when this airs, but you know, at this time we're doing mm-hmm. Easter sermons, but then in April, I'm going to start, um, they, they want to learn more about the old Testament and the Bible. So we're going to using first Corinthians 10 as a springboard. We're going to teach the examples that Israel has for us in the old Testament. We're going to walk through some of the basic stories and learn the basic Christian things that we need to know. Um, and, and what better way to learn about salvation than just walk, walking through the Isra- the pictures of Israel, salvation, leaving mm-hmm. Egypt. And then we're going to talk about baptism when they come through the Red Sea. And, and that'll be the first time that I that I preach about baptism and then invite people to talk to me if they're interested. So we have a bunch of baby Christians mm-hmm. who need to be baptized. And so it's you, you're thinking it, it would be very easy to just be like, all right, let's – what do I do? All right. I, I learned how to – I was taught how to teach expositionally. Book of John, John 1, 1. Let's just start preaching there every Sunday. Yeah. But but when you're starting out, they need the, they need milk, but they need the right milk, you know? Mm-hmm. And so really trying to, to teach the right things as we build this foundation over the course of this year. What a wonderful place to be. I mean, th- what you're doing right now, you will, you will never forget how nah. um, childlike and wonderful mm-hmm. this, this very moment is. Because five years from now, those same folks oh will goodness, be discipling. It'll be so different. Like they'll yeah. be, it'll be a completely different dynamic, a uh, different paradigm. And, and they'll be sitting down doing one-on-one discipleship with someone that they've led to Christ. And they know this and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. They're <laughs> going to, they're going to be confident in, in what yeah. they've learned. But like this moment right now, it really is like bringing home a newborn. I mean, yeah. it's, Amen. it's wonderful a to <laughs> a lot of them. Yeah. 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 And the, and the church here's, I was texting somebody the other day and I'm like, I'm, so I I was, I was listening to a discipleship conference. Actually, I was listening to those Mm -hmm. and being encouraged from over here in very encouraging sessions every year. But this Mm -hmm. year was especially encouraging to me because it was really focused on the parallels of parenting and, and discipleship, which are numerous in the Mm -hmm. Bible. And you know, all those parallels, but then you become a parent and then you see them experientially. Right. And so I was right. texting, I think Jay Shug, um, and I was like, bro, I'm at a st- the stage in my life, I have physical babies, like in my family, I have babies. And then I have a baby church plant that is made up of a bunch of baby Christians. It is yeah. a lot. It's awesome. It's yeah. rewarding. But anyone, any parent who's been through the baby stage knows, I don't even have to say it. It's just, it's, it's tiring, <laughs> yeah. you know, in a good way, in a fulfilling way. But it's the time you always look back to, like my kids are older than your kids and, you know, they're... They're How old are my your oldest kids now? is 12, 12 10, wow. and seven, or almost seven. She'll be, she's six right now. That's crazy. Um, I always say she's seven. I don't know why I say that, <laughs> but she's six. And um, man, they, they are all big and they're like, mm. they're doing their own thing and they're getting independent <laughs> and it's wonderful to see. But I miss like, sure, I, I do miss the baby stage. Like yeah. there's something really wonderful about that, the innocence mm-hmm. of it. And I think the same thing, the same longing, the same memories will exist for you. Oh, yeah. you know? uh, and, oh, yeah. uh, and it'll be fond, you know, what else is neat. And we always tell our, our guys this, right. When you're, when you're preparing for ministry, don't look, 
into the future so far that you miss what God's doing in your life right now. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I want to be a missionary. Well, what's God, what's God doing with you right now? Are you ignoring all those opportunities? And God, he's using whatever you're doing right now to prepare you for what he wants you to do later. You know, there's so many yeah. biblical examples of that. Moses is my favorite to go to. Um, mm-hmm. But in my life, oh man, I, I've been, I've done youth ministry since I was 18 years old. You know, I was a middle school guy for a couple of years. I was a high school guy for four years on staff. All I knew was youth ministry and teaching important foundational and sometimes deep things of the scripture, but learning how, and that's a skill, learning how to take yeah. those things and make them understandable to, um, to a youth. And so yeah. guess, guess what? All of my stuff that I've ever written that's in Dropbox is, it, it's incredibly relatable and incredibly helpful for me because that's all the stuff that I'm teaching now, not word yeah, for word, good. but it's like, this is God prepared me because I know how to communicate these things. He taught me how to for seven years, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and that's, and now that's what you're doing with, with young Christians is teaching them the, these important foundational truths and then maturing them so that they can handle meat in the future. And that segues into the next question that I had for you. And it's related uh, to, to what you're saying right now. And that is, what are some things that that you learned while you were in the States getting trained that you mm-hmm. couldn't see had value at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but they do now, like, like you recognize, oh man, that was a lesson that mm-hmm. I didn't know. I didn't have eyes to see, but now man, it applies. And, and it's, um, I'm glad that I went through that or I, I'm glad I yeah. learned that thing. What are some of those types of things that, that you've, you've learned? I, I, the, the big overarching theme, um, and this isn't like super, you know, glamorous or anything, but patience is a huge one. One thing that I just watched time and time again with the the other pastors that I worked with who would, you know, Jeff Bartell, Matt Brocker, guys like that, Troy later on, uh, I worked with him when he came to FBC. And what I learned from them being a guy in my mid twenties, <laughs> which is insane. Once you're in your mid thirties and you look back, you're like, why did anyone let me be a pastor in my mid twenties? No offense, but I remember myself. Facebook reminds me, you know, like 10 years ago <laughs> and I'm like, oh, who's that guy? Delete, delete that. And uh, just all the stuff I learned, and one of the biggest things was watching them not make decisions quickly, in, in small decisions and big decisions, hard ones, difficult decisions. It was never a even if it, even if the decision they made was the initial gut feeling, it was always a let's sit and let's pray and let's just let some time pass and this will make it self evident. Mm-hmm. And even when I was like, oh man, it's obvious that we should do this. And whether I was right or wrong, it was always very evident after letting time pass and waiting on the yeah. Lord. And so learning that patience and not, again, jumping the gun. Hi, I'm James Fife. I'm a faculty professor of missiology at Living Faith Bible Institute. And I would just like to take a minute to invite all of you uh, to consider signing up for really any of the classes, but especially our missions courses. We put a focus on uh, training and equipping believers, both biblically and in the local church and practically uh, to, to do the work that God has called us to. I've done it. I've been on the mission field myself uh, in a number of different capacities and in different countries. And so we speak both from a biblical perspective, but also from uh, an experienced perspective. You get that same thing across the curriculum and missions and really across the broader curriculum in LFBI. Please consider joining us and uh, allowing God to to lead you and get equipped for the work that he's called you to. Visit lfbi.org for any questions or to enroll and I will see you in class. you talked about getting the building. So when mm-hmm. we were, we, we were a Bible study for about a year, that entire year that we're doing Bible study, I know that the goal is to be a church. And so I'm walking our neighborhood several times a week and praying for our neighborhood and asking God to show me, where do you want this church to be established? I know the church isn't a building, but where is the key place that you want us to be? And, and so that whole year I'm praying and I'm even looking at, you know, real estate websites, even though we weren't ready for it to see, I don't even know how, what's the smallest space I can get, can get, what can I afford? What, where should I be, you know? Hmm. And so you're doing all of that to prepare you for the future. And, and, and I feel like some missionaries, they, they, they jump the gun because they feel, maybe they feel pressure 
Um, mm-hmm. Maybe indirectly, may- maybe nobody's saying, hey, you got to move faster, but they feel the pressure to move fast. And so, you know, before they're ready, they get a building, put up a sign, start had- holding services before they're ready, before their people are ready, before their family's yeah. ready. And so just teaching myself, reminding myself, wait on the Lord, be patient, do the research, do the work, but wait on him to say, okay, go. And and that's been um, a huge, huge part of it is just waiting on the Lord to, to make those. It, and it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't mean waiting is not passive, it's active. So you're doing research, you're doing work, but you're waiting on him because anytime I get trigger happy and jump the gun on God, it always goes wrong or it goes poorly mm. or I have to clean up messes, you know? Right. And I think that's the story of a lot of missionaries too, because I, I think you're right. I think you go with this perception that the work needs to look mature right away because that's what you know, right? right. You're coming from a church mm-hmm. that has all these resources, these tools, um, and, and they're functioning in maturity. And then when you land on the ground, you want to, you want to create that and establish that right away. And so, man, we need a, we need a building, we need mm-hmm. a worship team, we need uh, and then, and the worship team needs to look this particular way, and yeah. and uh, we need to have a youth minister, and we have to, you know, we have to have all these things because that's yeah. what churches look like. And and I need a nursery because my church had a nursery, but not right. all yeah. not all churches have nurseries. You know, you mm-hmm. like you don't know that if you don't visit other churches. If if you come from yeah. so like me, like our church is very similar in that they've been around for a long time. Well, well you're okay, Midtown is a church plant. It's not super old, but it came from a well-established church. And, sure. and it's a large church that has that has all the ins and outs now. FPC has been around for 160 plus years, very established, has nurseries. I've been to that church my whole life. When I went on deputation is when I started to see how smaller churches work. And that opened my eyes to like, oh, mm-hmm. okay. So not in a bad way, but like when I get there, I'm not going to have a giant building and people to staff a nursery and so all of that was really important to to understand. Like when you start, it's very much a couple of believers in a room and your wife is there, your kids are there and your kids are shouting and you tell them to knock it off and you keep <laughs> teaching. And yeah, it's, you know, so all of that stuff you, you have to learn. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I often think that if we actually look at the model that Paul gives us mm. and, and we read that for what it is, we just see how f- actually how flexible um, God was in the way that he wrote the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Like uh, there's just a lot of things that we do and know as Baptists that we um, just assume have to be true all the time. But, uh, yeah, but the I way gotcha. that Paul did mm-hmm. ministry, the way that he established churches, I think there's a lot of room f- to do things differently mm-hmm. and um to meet this way or to meet that way or to have these things or to not have mm-hmm. these things to, to be without or to have to, uh, you know, to abound. And Paul just models so beautifully for us, all these different circumstances and ways in which we can approach them. And so it leads me to, to, to ask about flexibility. I mean, mm. how important is it for you to be flexible in your approach to the work in your approach to people uh, the way you move about the city, the way that you engage. Mm-hmm. I think that that's a critical uh, component or, or character quality of a good missionary. How have you seen that played out in your work uh, so far? Yeah, well, flexibility is the name of the game. I, I don't care if you're going on a one-week mission trip. When I used to lead mission trip teams, I always told people, be flexible. Things aren't mm-hmm. going to go the way that we planned. We have a plan, but something's going to go wrong. So be flexible. That's the name of the game. And as, as a missionary, of course, it's the same. And God taught us that from the minute we started, we started deputation with a plan and every, the whole, the, literally the world went nuts. So like, okay, yeah. ditch that plan. Um, and, and even with that, I was trying to get into Hungary a certain way. And because of COVID, you couldn't just show up. Nowadays, if you come to Hungary, you can stay here for 90 days without doing anything, just with your blue passport and then like a tourist just, thing. Yeah. A tourist yeah. visa at the airport is 90 days. You can stay here, you know? Mm, and so cool. a lot of people back in the day, you just come show up, apply at the immigration office, you know, get your, you know, one or two year, uh, residence permit. All of that was mm-hmm. out the window. So I'm applying, my wife and I had to drive to New York city to go to an embassy, a Hungarian embassy and uh, apply in person for a visa. Cause they're like, we don't recommend you show up in Hungary without documentation. Cause mm. they might just send you back. Mm-hmm. So, so really learning all and all of going through all that and the process and like what I, all of those plans 
went down the drain and had to trust the Lord. And towards the end of the book of Acts, Paul is, um, he is on the ship, right? He's heading to Rome. God had told him he needed to go to Rome and, and, uh, there's that storm and, and God, you know, Paul's like, man, God, I need to go to Rome, but like, this is, this is crazy. And, and, and there's a huge storm and God says, don't worry, you're going to go to Rome, but you got to go to this island first. You know, yeah. we, we got a pit stop. There, there's something else that needs to happen on the way. The plan is still the plan, but how you get there is going to change. And God really spoke sure. that to me that like, hey, the plan's still the plan, but you're just going to have to trust me because there's this storm that's happening <laughs> over the whole world. And there's just some other things that we're going to have to do along the way. And so learning right. how to, to go with the flow um, ha- has been huge. Yeah. And, and in that same story, in that se- sequ- sequence of events, Paul insists, uh, you know, on this, on ministering to, to the Jews in Jerusalem, he insists on that. Mm-hmm. And when he's, the moment he's kind of inflexible and, and does it mm-hmm. his way, it actually gets more difficult for him. He, yeah. he actually, you know, finds himself kind of pushing back and, and it doesn't go as well as, as it should have, or maybe even the way that God had planned it or orchestrated it for him initially in his plan. And so to that same point, like it's really important for us to be flexible. And mm-hmm. when we're not, we actually do make things harder for us long-term and we find ourselves maybe painted into a corner mm-hmm. um, that we have to grapple with, you know, and that could be, you know, just to use the building example, to get yourself bound up in a lease agreement sure. uh, before you're ready or with without the support or before you have a need or cornered into having to preach weekly. That takes time mm-hmm. and effort. Sure. And do you have a translator who can do that? Now you're devoting two or three days of your week to preparing for Sunday when it could have been devoted to language study and relationship building. Yeah. And so the yeah. first two years really that we were on the field here was devoted to relationship building and language study, mostly mm-hmm. because God made me because of COVID. If God wouldn't have made me, I would have been trying to do all sorts of stuff because I, I, I like to go, I like to move. Um, yeah. God made me wait, but you know what, in, in regards to ministry though, Brandon too, with, uh, flexibility, it, it, we can, if we're not flexible, we can harm the ministry of course. So like one thing that, and we preach this really well in, in our missions classes and LFBI and in our churches is, you know, the awareness of you, you have to, um, assimilation, assimilation. Yeah. Okay. And so some of that is just being aware and, and we we're it's ingrained in us that, Hey, the Baptists of the seventies, eighties and nineties, a lot of them, Bro, they just they brought their Americanness over with their Bible, and and we got to be careful not to just be, you know, preachers of American culture, and and mm-hmm. so we're. I feel like our fellowship is very good at making sure that we're not going to do that. Um, yeah, but at the same time, there's things you don't even realize, like we were saying earlier, that like that's but that's just how church is done. Well, okay, you 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 need the Bible. There's some key things that make a church. And there's actually yeah. not that many. There, there, there's, no. like a, there's, there's, there's two ordinances. There's, there's one faith. There's one salvation. There's one Bible. There's one Lord. You know, there, there's a mm-hmm. few key things that make make a church doctrinally. All mm-hmm. the rest is left left up to, I won't say preference, but preference, culture, pragmatism. Sometimes that that sounds evil. I don't mean it evil. But where right. you meet, how Me- you conduct your service. Yeah, what time you meet. I, I was just reading a book. I just finished it yesterday. Um, Literally, because I heard Sam Miles mention it in one of the, it's really funny. He just mentioned a book in passing at Discipleship Mm -hmm. Conference in one of his sessions called Bruchko. And he said Mm -hmm. it was a missions book and I hadn't read that one. I was like, oh, great. And, um, you know, that dude, I don't know if he was a Baptist or not. He did a lot of wrong things. It was really encouraging because he made a lot of mistakes and God used it. That was really encouraging. But something that he, he was reaching Motalone tribal uh, Mm -hmm. Indians in uh, Colombia, I believe. And, you know, just as a single white guy going to them in like the sixties and, and he saw missionaries who were there that the Indians didn't want anything to do with because they were making them foreigners. They were stealing their culture. Yeah. And, and, and he said so many times throughout the book, like, and so he was always praying like Jesus, what you need to become Modillion or you, you need to become these people. And so how do I teach them to be Christians without teaching them to be an American? And so that's, that's way more obvious in a tribal third world setting, but where you're in a European yeah. big city urban culture where it's like, yeah, we have Western technologies. We have Western conveniences. I've noticed this. That book was really encouraging to me just recently because there's things that I think, well, we need to have this because now we're a church and it's like, well, 
okay, but you need to assess all of that and be flexible. Do we need to have this or do we need to see what, what is, what is good for them? Because I don't need to make mm-hmm. them American Christians. I need to make them Christians. And that's yeah, going to look. be disciples yes, of Jesus. The Hungarian yeah. disciples. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think that that's super important and it's good for, for us to hear it. I mean, and to have those conversations because we spend our whole lives in a culture mm-hmm. and, um, and the older you get, <laughs> the more set in your ways you yeah. become. And, um, you know, you have a, a very established, you know, uh, what's sometimes referred to as like a social imaginary where you can't oh. help, but, but see everything from a particular perspective. But when you get, you know, wrenched out of your, your kind of cultural world and placed into a new one, that'll either break you because mm-hmm. you can't, you can't find yourself being flexible. You mm-hmm. can't find yourself conforming to the norms of that society uh, or you dive in and you said, God, you say, God, make me who I need to be in mm-hmm. order to do the things that you really taught me. The ways, the ways of your son are to preach the gospel, to mm-hmm. teach your word, to establish disciples, um, to, to worship and praise your name <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and to send people to do the same in other places. It's a very, very simple mission that we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if we, if we bring our own mission, which we mm-hmm. may not always have eyes to see, well, well we could actually yeah. foil the plan. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like, I don't want people to hear wrong. Like God sent, okay. So we'll just use me as an example. God sent me to do this work. Could have sent somebody else. There's other people here, but he sent me to do this and to reach Mm -hmm. the people that I'm reaching. And so I don't have to like, pretend I'm not me. I don't have to leave my, I don't have to leave everything about me behind just because Hudson Taylor wore local clothes. Doesn't mean that I have to pretend I'm not an American. I was an American for 30 years. You know, and so I don't have to pretend Mm -hmm. to not like American football or not like American style pizza, like what, you know, but am I willing to also do other, am I willing to be aware and to give up things? Because if it really, it's a test of where, who, what your identity is, is my identity in my culture and everything I grew up with. And you miss it. Of course you miss it. You know, sometimes I just mm-hmm. really want good wings, man, good chicken wings. It's just not, I didn't realize <laughs> that was an American thing. Barbecue wings. It is. And so sometimes yeah. you just miss something simple, barbecue wings and a root beer. Um, mm-hmm. But, but at the same time, those things don't matter. They don't matter. And, and so am I, is my identity in that stuff or is my identity in Christ? And am I willing to give up? And, and that's part of the sacrifice that you're making to go reach another people is leaving, willingly leaving stuff behind that you like. They're not evil. They're not wrong, but you're willingly leaving those behind. And you know what? It's, it's fun to share some of your things with your friends. And so like, sometimes we'll, we'll do a Thanksgiving dinner. They don't have Thanksgiving over here. I think Thanksgiving mm-hmm. is a pretty good theme to teach any culture, you know, regardless mm-hmm. of football and mashed potatoes, it, it's a good right. theme. And so we've done that yeah. before and invited friends over and they're like, oh, this is interesting, but I'm not forcing mm-hmm. it. Like we don't now have a Thanksgiving ministry at our church. Like <laughs> I don't know, maybe someday it will be. I don't know. We're kind of playing, you yeah. know, flying by the seat of our pants here and just doing sure. <laughs> what the Lord shows us. But like, I don't feel like, well, this is what we have to do. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, you know, it's a part of me, but it's not who I am. Yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. That's really important. No, I think, I think those are all really important things to distinguish and for people to con- consider. Um, even when they're ministering, um, just in, in their own community and, mm-hmm. and, in, engaging with cultures that are different than theirs. If there, if there are, you know, internationals in their community or, or young people in their community or older people in their community. And, um, I think it's just really important for us to always remember what it looks like to put aside our stuff, uh, in order to emphasize Christ's stuff. Um, but, yeah. uh, I also want to ask you about, um, your family and, and how they're adapting and, and what that's like. I mean, taking a family on the, on the field is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, not easy. You actually had uh, a child since being on the field. Um, tell us about how they're doing and, and give us an update on that. Yeah. So Judah will be six in May and Isaac is about a year and a half old now. And uh, so, yeah, we moved to the field. Judah was two and a half. And so our family has grown since moving here. Um, really our only family visit back to the States was to give birth to Isaac. You know, I, I went back once for a couple of weeks just to do some work, but our family's only been back in the States one time since moving. And mm-hmm. um, so they, we've all like, our boys have lived here 
longer than they lived in America. And so Judah has been going to Hungarian school. School system works a little differently here, um, but he's been going to pre-K slash kindergarten for the last almost three years, um, only Hungarian, no English. And so he's basically bilingual now. He's, it's, it's, it's been so much fun to watch him grow and he's still growing. We practice together. Um, we're, we're all at different levels. So he's five. So even if he mm-hmm. was fluent for a five-year-old, you know, he doesn't even speak English that well because he's five, you know, but, but he, he speaks pretty darn well. And so, and, and then I'm intermediate for an adult, but I'm also learning really hard words that have to do with the Bible and theology. So it's like, you know, the levels are not, you yeah. know, it's apples and oranges. And then my wife is somewhere in between that because she's learning slower than us because she's raising the boys. And, and so we get to practice together and, um, learning how to be a bilingual family and, and Judah goes to school. Have you guys gotten closer? I mean, do you think you're closer in this setting than you would be if you were back in the States? Um, I mean, you rely on each other in a different way, I think, when you're on the field. Oh, for sure. Because you, you get really lonely if um, if, you, if you go the way that we did <laughs> well, during a pandemic. But like if, you, if you're not joining an established ministry. So we rely mm-hmm. on each other. And, and I work from home. This is the office that I work in most of the time it, for the foreseeable future. Um, and so I, you know, we're, we're definitely a lot closer in that regard, but it's also really cool. Cause like Judah and Isaac will see this too. Like we're learning the language together. We're building a church together and Judah, like on Sundays after church is over, like Judah Brooke takes Isaac home cause he's ready for a nap. It's a five minute walk from our house anyway. And so Isaac stays behind or Judah stays behind and he, he wants to like take out the garbage and he, he wants to help yeah. and. And he hopes that I'll buy him a snack on the way home from one of the stores. But, you know, so it's like you're, if it's, if it's your life, if ministry is your life, you don't have to like be in, well, you do have to be intentional, but you don't have to try to be intentional. It just happens. You just, you do it together because you're a family and you're in it together and it's not dad's work. It's, this is life. This is what, and it's easier when you're on the field. Cause like, this is why we're here. It's not like you can just forget like in America, it's life gets busy, children, sports, all of this stuff. And you can forget that, Hey, we're supposed to be doing this together. But when you move to another country, like this is the reason we live in this country. And so it, it makes that, um, a little bit easier to, to do everything together like that. What's the uh, remainder of the year look like for you and, and maybe share with us, um, how people can support you guys and mm. both in prayer, but also financially give us some insight in, into what yeah. is ahead of you in the near future. And then, and then how we can stand with you. Yeah. Well, this year is, is vital obviously in planting the church. And so building the foundation, growing, um, young Christians in their faith and, and established. So just recently, a couple of weeks ago, I preached a vision casting, um, sermon. And, and to be honest, I don't know how many churches, even Baptist churches in Hungary have mission and vision statements. I know some of them do, but I don't know how many of them have like a vision that's kind of doubling as our path of growth. Cause we're, we're just rolling with a love, grow, share type vision statement. Um, but that also, you know, factors into growth and, you know, love, learn to love God, get saved, learn to love God, learn to love people, grow in your faith, discipleship, be it, you know, prioritize coming to church to learn about God and then share, sharing your faith. That's not, I, I'm learning that in this culture, like people, they're not super open people. So, so teaching, even people have been Christians for a decade here, how to share their faith. It's, it's not natural. And so, mm. you know, so I just recently was, you know, preaching on that and, and obviously you don't teach a vision sermon and that's it. And then the vision stuck. It's like, you have to continue to make that, you know, the DNA of everything that you teach and everything that you do until it sticks. And that'll take a long time. But, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so this year is really pivotal, pivotal in establishing the church, even the legal stuff behind it, like, you know, working on getting the legal stuff so that we can have a bank account and all that. And, you know, all of that stuff ha- it happens yeah. behind the scenes that people don't think about. And then yeah, building yeah, yeah. into, to our young believers and when they're ready and when they're faithful enough to be discipled. Um, and then, I mean, obviously we're doing life on life discipleship, whether people realize it or not, because you're investing in these people that you love and care about. But, you know, that next level of that requires faithfulness as a prerequisite um, that that'll come in in its time as well. And that's all stuff um, that we we want to and need to pray about. Um, if people want to support you financially, where, where should they go? Yeah, well, um, check out our website, horvaths 2 hungrycom You can use the word two or the number two. They both go to the same place. And you can check out what we do. You can subscribe to our newsletter. Um, our newsletter's on Substack because um, I'm 
you know, a millennial and trendy and I <laughs> got annoyed with MailChimp chimp or whatever it's called. So, yeah. you know, you can follow yeah. us on there. We do a monthly newsletter and follow us on Facebook. Same thing, Horvath to Hungary. Um, there, there's information about um, financially support, supporting us on the website, um, but we're just, we're not through a missions agency. We're, we're sent out of our local church. Our local church mm-hmm. sent us. There are sending agency. They collect all the finances and send them to us as well. So that's a blessing. Um, yeah, but yeah, everything can be found on Facebook or our website at Horvath to Hungary. And, you know, uh, before we close, I want you to, to tease your book. You just wrote a book that, uh, that living faith books is going to publish this year. Um, the, the ball is rolling on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell it, tell us about the book and, and, and why you wrote it. Yeah. So the book is called Brainwashed, um, Deconstructing the Battle for Our Minds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so really, it's I, I was writing it over the last couple of years. Since, since we came to the field, um, when I was a youth pastor years ago, I did a series. So man, this might've been like 2017 or something, a long time ago. I did mm-hmm. a, a series called Brainwashed in, in our youth ministry because I saw this deconstructionism in Christianity is not a new thing. This has been, it was new, but now, I mean, it's probably been about the last 10 years that we've been talking about deconstruction. Yeah, it's been in, in kind of popular culture, Christian yeah. culture for about 10 years now, yeah. Right, and so you see famous guys like, you know, the I Kiss Dating good, Goodbye guy, yeah, right. author, yeah. you know. So it's usually, it starts with these famous people and then people take notice because it's, oh, this was a famous Christian and now they're not a Christian at all. Um, but but what's more concerning is seeing the droves of young people who grew up in a you know a Bible believing and preaching church who have not just like stopped being so religious, but if the pendulum has swung so far the other way that they're antagonistic against faith at all. It's mm-hmm. it's it's obviously it's to be expected because of the times that we live in, but it's concerning because I think it's on an individual basis. I think it's preventable. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, on a whole in the world that the times are going to be what the times are in Laodicea. But, um, so really it's, it's, it's a book because I I think that, and and I saw a lot of people online back in 2020, 2021, people that we grew up with or knew who were leaving their faith. And then always nobody leaves silently. They have to get a few likes out of it. They have to get a few dopamine hits from it. So there's Mm -hmm. an Instagram post, there's a Facebook post, whatever platform they like, where they explain why they're leaving and, you know, get a few likes out of it. Their their declaration, nobody just leaves. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it was just getting frustrating to me. So it really came out of a frustration that like, because these people knew better. I think they should have known better. Um, but what I, what I think, I think a good antidote to all of this deconstructionism and people leaving their faith is just having a better understanding of the enemies of the Christian. And so in the book, we do a deep dive on the three enemies of the Christian, right? The devil, the flesh, mm-hmm. and the world, and how they work and what their strategies are and why specifically they're so interested in the battle for our minds. If you're already a Christian, right? You're saved. They can't take your soul. They, they can't prevent you from going to heaven, but they can put you on the sidelines and, and make you um, not helpful, not um, usable in God's mission or even worse, antagonistic against it. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that rather than deconstruction, deconstruction, just, it just means analyzing, but, mm-hmm. but it's now a negative connotation. You know, it never, deconstruction yeah. never seems to end in a stronger faith. It always ends in people leaving their faith. So sure. rather than mm-hmm. deconstructing your doubt and your faith, or let's deconstruct the enemies of the Christian, understand what they're doing. And if we can understand that, then I then I think we can combat against what the enemy is trying to do to our mind to get us to be um, unusable in the Lord's yeah. mission. I think it's going to be a really good book for people to read uh, in order to maybe uh, further establish their biblical worldview. Um, you, you, the book really does address a lot of contemporaneous topics, uh, things that we we run into in our world today that are, are unique and uh, how to spot those things as lies. Basically what you're doing is, is you're helping us to expose um, the network or the web of lies that, that yeah. are, that is ever increasing all around us all mm-hmm. the time. And, and so the book does a really good job of, of helping us see things um, in spiritual terms. Yeah. I hope it's encouraging. And I hope that, you know, some man, it would be amazing if somebody who's actually, you know, deconstructing their faith got a hold of it and and, and it actually helped mm-hmm. them to come to grips with their faith rather than uh, yeah. leave it all together. That would yeah, be wonderful. for sure. Well, Kale, um, we're praying for you, man. I'm so grateful that you hung out with us, that uh, that you took the time 
um, to, to be with us, tell your family that we're grateful for it too. Absolutely. Um, but we Anytime. love you and, and, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to, to share you, uh, with the audience <laughs> once again, and hopefully we'll check in like this from time to time and, uh, and give people updates on the work and what God's doing in your life. Maybe, maybe when the book comes out, we'll do another interview to, to talk about the book. Sounds great, man. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We are also thankful for you, the audience, uh, for hanging out with us for another episode of The Postscript. Uh, we, we love to spend this time hanging out with uh, men and women of God, uh, people that we can look to as in samples for our own ministry. And, and so hopefully today, as you listen to Kale and his testimony, his story, uh, you recognize uh, a greater need to grow in the Word, a greater need to take the mission serious. Uh, some of you, when you hear an interview like this, uh, you begin thinking about, well, man, am, am I supposed to be on the field? Is is God calling me to a work? And, and these are all things that need to be investigated. And we need to make full proof of our ministry. Uh, we need to study to show ourselves approved as well. And so that's why we want to invite you to check out lfbi.org and the Living Faith Bible Institute, because we want to be a part of training you theologically uh, and in God's word as you minister in your local church. Uh, Kale is a, a graduate of the Living Faith Bible Institute, and uh, he got training in the Bible as he was also being trained in the work of ministry in his local church, and and obviously God is, is using him uh, in a kingdom work now. And so we want to invite you to hang out with us and spend time with us in class. Uh, $40 a credit hour, we, we believe is about as cheap as you could get a Bible education nowadays. And so we want you to think about it and visit the website and learn more about it. But most importantly, uh, we want to thank you for being with us today, and we want to invite you to come back again next week for another episode of The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.